This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com. I wanted to talk about the upside-down cross symbol, the, quote, beatification of John Paul II, and perhaps a few other issues. People know that in the year 2000, when he was in Israel, John Paul II sat with a large upside-down cross over his head. And when we exposed this, we were actually attacked not only by defenders of anti-Pope John Paul II and members of the Vatican II Church, but even by some sedevacantists. They said that John Paul II's decision to sit in a chair with a huge upside-down cross over his head didn't indicate anything nefarious or occultic at all, because St. Peter, according to tradition, was crucified upside-down in Rome. This is a ridiculous argument, as we've pointed out in the past, because the upside-down cross is clearly one of the most recognizable symbols in Satanism. It's used by satanic heavy metal groups, mass murderers, occultists of various stripes, and there was no commemoration of St. Peter whatsoever when John Paul II sat in the chair with the upside-down cross over his head. The Catholic Church does not use the upside-down cross, and the only exception would be perhaps an altar or a shrine that is specifically and clearly dedicated to St. Peter. When John Paul II did it, it was not the feast day of St. Peter. It was not any one of his feast days, and there was no indication that he was commemorating St. Peter at all. But it's another example of an action that is evil and symbolic, but there's just enough of a touch of ambiguity so that the wicked defenders of the counter-church can try to excuse it or explain it away. Those who did defend his use of the upside on cross, whether they were members of the Vatican II Church or Sedevacantists, are defenders of the workers of iniquity and demonstrate bad will. And on this point, I recently came across an interesting quote, and it deals with the period between the Second Crusade and the Third Crusade. At that time, there was a huge battle at the Horns of Hatton. It was at this battle that the crusading Christians suffered their worst defeat at the hands of the Muslims of any defeat they suffered during the period of the Crusades. In other words, it was the worst moment for the Christians in the Crusades. During this battle, the true cross was captured by the Muslims. And I want to quote from a book called The New Concise History of the Crusades by Thomas F. Madden, page 76. He says, quote, Saladin, the leader of the Muslims, also won for himself a great symbolic prize. The true cross, carried into battle by the king of Jerusalem, was paraded through the streets of Damascus upside down, end quote. So, after winning this huge battle, that was so devastating to the Christian side. The Muslims took the true cross and paraded it around the streets of Damascus upside down. I don't think they were doing it to honor St. Peter. They were doing it because it represented the overturning of Christianity, the destruction and defeat of Christianity. And that's also what John Paul II meant by sitting in the chair with the upside down cross over his head since we believe he was not only an anti-pope, but actually the anti-Christ, it makes sense that he would sit with this symbol over his head. By the way, I should probably add that the devastating loss suffered at the Horns of Hatton at the hands of the Muslims was essentially avenged in the Third Crusade under Richard the Lionheart, and the First Crusade, of course, was a miraculous success, so it's not as if the Muslims had the ultimate victory. Now this brings me to another point, which is where did John Paul II sit with the huge upside down cross over his head? He did it in Israel. If John Paul II is in fact the Antichrist, as we believe, someone else can disagree with that, but that's what we believe, we can prove without any doubt that he was an anti-pope and a heretic and an Antichrist, but we believe he was the Antichrist. It therefore would make sense that he would appear in Israel with the upside down cross over his head because it was in Israel where the true Christ was on the cross. And so if John Paul II was the Antichrist, when he was in the Holy Land, he appeared as the antithesis to Christ on the cross with the upside-down cross over his head. It's also such a bold move to sit in a chair with a huge upside-down cross over your head 
in front of 100,000 people and on television that would be broadcast to millions of people that he could probably only get away with it once. And of course, the devil's dupes tried to explain it away. On this point, we recently saw the, quote, beatification of John Paul II on May 1st. As we've discussed, we believe that it will be the canonization of John Paul II by Benedict XVI that will fulfill Apocalypse 13 and the second beast causing people to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. We explain that in our video, Is the World About to End? Parts 5 through 7. The entire video, however, is necessary to get a full picture of that point. And the reason we believe it's the, quote, canonization and not the beatification is simply because a beatification is not a binding decree on the universal church. It's a formal allowance that such a person may be considered blessed. It doesn't command the entire church to recognize him as one of the saints. It simply allows those who want to regard him as a blessed in certain areas to do so. It's therefore important, but it doesn't invoke the magisterial binding teaching authority of the church. With the canonization, that's when the entire church is commanded to recognize this individual as a saint. That's why canonization has been held to be infallible and not necessarily beatification. Nevertheless, the, quote, beatification of John Paul II was extremely significant because it was a manifestation of apostasy to even allow such a heretic to be called blessed. And it's also the major step that precedes the, quote, canonization. Benedict XVI, of course, being a heretic and an anti-pope, has no authority to beatify or canonize anyone. But the point is that in view of the conciliar church, he does have authority. And when he, quote, canonizes John Paul II, he will be forcing the entire group of individuals who acknowledge him as Pope to worship as a saint in the sense of veneration, John Paul II. This distinction between the allowance that beatification confers and the obligation that canonization imposes is clear in the beatification formula. In the formula that was pronounced by Benedict XVI in regard to John Paul II, he said, among other things, quote, With our apostolic authority, we concede that the venerable servant of God, John Paul II, Pope, from this hour can be called blessed. And he goes on to say, And it is possible to celebrate his feast. End quote. Therefore, it's a concession. It's not a command for the universal church. It's still extraordinarily evil, and it's the big symbolic step that precedes the, quote, canonization. However, it's not the command. There's already a report that the, quote, canonization of John Paul II will occur in one to five years, and it might be much sooner than five years. It might be a year or two. When that occurs, it will be the, quote, canonization of new church, and the defenders of the anti-pope will be forced to venerate as a saint this man, John Paul II, who denied everything, taught universal salvation, denied every dogma you can basically imagine, taught that every man is the son of God. And that brings me to another point, which is that we believe John Paul II is the Antichrist not only because his trademark teaching was that every man is the son of God, and that fits precisely with the Bible's definition of Antichrist and the dissolving of Jesus, and not only because he fits with what's prophesied in Apocalypse 13, etc., but also because he represented the Antichrist in so many other ways. For example, he was the man who buried Fatima. It was under his watch that the phony third secret of Fatima was published in the year 2000, and essentially he buried Fatima in the eyes of most of the world. Not only did he bury Fatima, but he wound up putting himself at the center of the fulfillment of the third secret, because in the Vatican's official interpretation, confirmed by the impostor sister Lucia. John Paul II was the man who fulfills the third secret. So he buries Fatima, he's the anti-Fatima, and he puts himself as the fulfillment of it. That's the role of the Antichrist. It makes sense that he would do that. Also, there were numerous other symbolic actions, like I was saying earlier, about how it was in Israel that he appeared with the upside-down cross over his head. It was also in the year 2000 and around the year 2000 that he did a number of things that are highly symbolic. For example, 
At that time, he proclaimed new martyrs at the Roman Colosseum. There was this big ceremony in Rome at the Roman Colosseum at the spot where the true Christian Catholic martyrs were tortured and killed for not denying the faith. And at this holy spot, he proclaims all kinds of non-Catholics to be the new martyrs. He is directly mocking the true saints and martyrs and their sacrifice at the very spot where they made this sacrifice. That was the role of the Antichrist. He's overturning everything that's important to traditional Christianity. It was at this same time, around the year 2000, that he denied that heaven, hell, and purgatory are places. He therefore undercut the very foundation of eternal life. And that was reported all over the world. It was questioned for a little while, and then people moved on. It was also around the year 2000 that he apologized for the, quote, sins of the church, for the crusades, these holy endeavors which were approved by the church, which represented the battle against evil. He therefore mocked the church. And the year 2000 is significant because in his first encyclical, Redemptor Hominis, John Paul II cryptically alludes to a mark on the face of human history that will be left by the year 2000. As we explained in the video, Is the World About to End? It was also just before the year 2000 that he rejected the entire Council of Trent by agreeing with the Lutherans on the doctrine of justification and teaching justification by faith alone and that the Council of Trent no longer applied. Thus, by the year 2000, he had systematically mocked or denied every important aspect of Christianity. And of course, there was his notorious promotion of false ecumenism and every detail it involved. He specifically bowed his head with the Jews as they prayed for the coming of the Messiah in the synagogue. That was the role of the Antichrist because he wanted to make it public that as the representative of what people thought was the Christian church, he's saying Jesus isn't even the Messiah. He drinks from the bowl that the pagans concoct specifically to deny what is taught in 1 Corinthians about not drinking from the chalice of devils, and on and on and on. And so he covered all the bases. The point is that there was much more than his preaching that every man is Jesus Christ, his notorious promotion of false ecumenism, his fulfillment of Apocalypse 13, which persuades us that he was the Antichrist. It's that he covered it all. He represented the overturning of the traditional Christian faith. And those who accept Benedict XVI in light of the, quote, beatification of anti-Pope John Paul II, blaspheme God and deny Jesus Christ. And when he, quote, canonizes him, they will be worshiping the beast, in our view, but certainly a beast and an antichrist. Here's something else that's extremely interesting. If you do a search for the term upside-down cross or inverted cross, Guess who comes up more prominently and more frequently than anyone or anything else? That's right, John Paul II. He has been memorialized throughout the world with the upside-down cross. Anyone who searches for the term will find him displaying the symbol. Wouldn't it make sense that as the Christ is identified with the cross, the Antichrist would go down in history as synonymous with the upside-down cross.